which they already have, so thank you very much. At this point, let us all welcome the academicians, Dr. Arnel N. Del Barrio. Dr. Glenn B. Gregorio. Dr. Seferino P. Maala. Dr. Euphemio T. Rasco. Dr. Carmencita D. Padilla. And Dr. Ruben L. Villarreal. National Scientist, Dr. Dolores A. Ramirez. Please welcome the UPLB Executive Committee of the University Council, led by the Executive Committee Marshal, Dean Decibel F. Eslava. Following her are the members of the Executive Committee. Dean Elpidio M. Advisit, College of Agriculture and Food Science. Officer in charge, Dr. Christine Margus N. Pinol, College of Arts and Sciences. Dean Maria Stella C. Tirod, College of Development Communication. Officer in charge, Dr. Myra G. Borines, College of Engineering and Agro-Industrial Technology. Dean Dr. Agam C. Cuevas of the College of Economics and Management. Officer in charge, Dr. Marites G. Yi, College of Human Ecology. Dean Rowena Titi Bakongis, College of Public Affairs and Development. Director Mark Lester M. Chico. Director Eileen Lorena M. Mamino. University Registrar Dr. Maribel D. Sese. Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs Dr. Janet M. Silva. Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension, Dr. Merdilyn C. Litt. Vice Chancellor for Planning and Development, Dr. Fernando O. Paras, Jr. Vice Chancellor for Administration, Professor Rolando T. Bellio. And Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Dr. Jean O. Loyola. Former UPLB Chancellor, Dr. Fernando C. Sanchez, Jr. The officers, the officers of the UP system, Assistant Vice President for Public Affairs and Director, Office of Alumni Relations, Dr. Jose Wendell P. Capilli. Vice President for Administration, Dr. Nestor G. Yunque. Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Maria Cynthia Rose B. Bautista. And Executive Vice President, Dr. Teodoro J. Herbosa. The Board of Regents, Honorable Myla R. Pedrano. Honorable Rene Luis Co. Honorable Amy Lynn Barion Dupo. Honorable Maria Arlisa Diaz Aguiluz, Honorable Angelo A. Jimenez, and Honorable Francis C. Laurel. <laughs> Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Dr. Jose V. Camacho, Jr. Carrying the University Mace is a Secretary of the University and of the Board of Regents, Attorney Roberto M. J. Lara. The President of the University of the Philippines, Professor Danilo L. Concepcion. Let us all remain standing, everybody. Let us all rise for the entrance of our honoree, National Scientist, Emil Q. Javier.
please remain standing for the entrance of callers and the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Please be seated. To introduce our honoree, we would like to call on Dr. Euphemio T. Rasco, Jr., Academician and Chairperson, Agricultural Division, National Academy of Science and Technology. National Scientist uh, Emil Q. Javier, President Danilo Concepcion, University of the Philippine System, Honorable Board of Regents, officials of the university, members of the faculty, National Scientist Dolores Ramirez, 
fellow academicians, guests. Thank you so much, UP, for the honor of introducing national scientist Javier. We are here today not so much to justify national scientist Javier's selection for the honor of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa, but to draw lessons and inspiration from his impactful achievements. Let me start with the easy one. What has he done to earn this recognition? Is he a lawyer? We can only imagine because we were not part of the selection process. We can be guided by the criteria set by the Legal Education Board, which I quote, the LLDHC is an extraordinary degree awarded to an eminent individual of integrity who has distinguished him or herself in the field of law, justice administration, governance, leadership, or public service through outstanding work and or exemplary service to society, and code. So there it is. One does not have to be a lawyer to earn this special degree. In fact, the minimum is a bachelor's degree. So how did the selection committee go through the process? To start with, I imagine that someone in the selection committee would have asked in disbelief, why only now? If he was bestowed this honor 30 years ago, soon after he has served the country as director of IPB, chancellor of UPLB, director of CIRCA, and minister of science and technology exceptionally well before he was even 45 years old, no one would have complained. By that time, he might have earned more than enough points in governance, leadership, and public service. But UP must be so selective. I imagine the selection committee reviewing the history of Honoris Causa itself to see if or where national scientists have been fits as a matter of course. In the old days, this honor is given to special personalities who have wealth or political power, or better still, both, among other basic traits. National scientist Javier does not fit into this mold. So let us not expect him to donate a 10-story building to UP anytime soon. Maybe he will donate a smaller one if he wins the lottery. He was persuaded to be a politician once in 2007 when he ran for congressman under the party list Agham, representing the marginalized science sector. But he lost in the most revealing manner. His party got less votes than the candidates of ex-convicts, public transport operators, and senior citizens, among others. It is wise of national scientist Javier not to try politics again. Politics, obviously, is beyond his pay grade. In any case, UP has so up the bar for honoris causa in a different way that the last hour this, I recall, include a Nobel Prize and a World Food Laureate, both of them foreign nationals. A Filipino national scientist of global stature, like uh, national scientist Javier, of course, is in the same league and more. What national scientist has demonstrated consistently over the past half century are personal qualities such as vision, energy, well-rounded intelligence, integrity, humanity, and wisdom, an extremely rare combination indeed. More significantly, he deployed these natural gifts to serve the underprivileged sector of society through actions that last forever. 
building institutions. No doubt, this did not escape the attention of the selection committee. Let me recount some of the instances that illustrate these achievements. But please be aware that because of time limitations, I can only provide snapshots. For those who know him better, I apologize for unintended omissions. Very few of us know, but national scientist Javier is basically a scholar and a Canadian. He was the recognized pioneer in research of pasture and forage crop in the Philippines. Between 1970 and 1975, before he became a research administrator par excellence, he was credited with over 40 research papers on agronomy and breeding pasture grasses. Holding the Circa Professorial Chair for Forage and Pasture Technology, he won back-to-back -back Best Paper Awards from the Philippine Society of Animal Science in 1973 and 1974. It was for these outstanding accomplishments that he was recognized as one of the 10 outstanding young men of the Philippines and was given the Rizal Pro Patria Award, about the highest uh, recognition that one can get in this country for agriculturists. National scientist Javier's reputation as institution builder and visionary started with the Institute of Plant Breeding right here in UP Los Baños which he proposed for creation way back when he was in his early 30s, fresh from gradu graduate school in the University of Illinois and Cornell University as a young assistant professor in the Department of Agronomy. One who lived during these times will know that the country was ruled by a brilliant dictator, Abartap Natsaradda perhaps the best academically qualified among all the Filipino presidents, who surrounded himself with highly capable men, including the much revered Secretary of Agriculture at that time, Arturo Tanco, the architect of the Philippine version of the Green Revolution. These kind of leaders must be tough to persuade particularly by an unknown young man, obviously hungry for research funds, son of a Bison driver and part-time school teacher from the remote town of Santa Cruz, Laguna, and that is national scientist Javier. But he got past both Marcos and Tanco, a fitting measure of his charisma, vision, and persuasive skills. Upon learning of his IPB idea, Marcos invited him to join the presidential plane on a flight to China, and it was over the West Philippine Sea that the presidential decree creating IPB was signed. The decree gave UP the money to buy 200 hectares, put up infrastructure, hundreds of regular positions and scholarships for prospective staff, all dedicated to plant breeding research. National scientist Serb, National Scientist Javier Serb as the first IPB director. From then on, National Scientist Javier Star continued to shine brighter during the Marcos years as he breezed through such position as Chancellor of UPLB Minister of Science and Technology, and concurrently, Director General of National Science Development Board, which is the equivalent today of the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology, all before he was 45 years old. And he accomplished all of this while raising a family with five children. Of course, he could not have done all of this alone. We must credit his wisdom and persuasive ability for choosing, or rather his luck, for being chosen by Mrs. Alma Javier, 
who is his constant source of inspiration and energy to this day. As Chancellor of UPLB, he created a system of research institutes, the National Institute of Biotechnology and Applied Microbiology or Biotech, Farming Systems and Soil Resources Institute, and the National Gene Bank to complement the traditional academic department system. As a plant breeder, he understood the value of genetics, traditional and modern, but also recognized its limitations. Genetics has to be complemented by a nurturing environment which accounts for his farming system's thinking. As science minister, he established the system of research councils that includes now familiar acronyms as PCHRD, PSHIRD, and PICARD. These councils provided a mechanism for systematic evaluation and funding of research ideas and dissemination of research results. But most significantly, for the science community as far as I'm concerned, he established the scientific career system, the one single act that inspired the marginalized researchers in the public sector to pursue a scientific career. National scientist Javier could have suffered the fate of most of Marcos cabinet men who were fired by President Aquino in 1986 as an aftermath of the EDSA revolution. But he was returned along with only one other Marcos cabinet man. Considering President Aquino's known penchant for throwing away everyone and everything associated with Marcos, national scientist Javier's retention in the cabinet was a very clear measure of his professionalism, integrity, and ability. But the years leading to 1986 must have been draining even for an energetic young person that national scientist Javier was. He needed a break. He left the Philippines and joined the Corps of Experts in the International Agricultural Research Service in 1966. First, a senior fellow of the International Service for National Agricultural Research, or ISNAR, based in the Netherlands, and later as director of the Asian Vegetable Research and Development Center based in Taiwan. He was the first citizen of a developing country to hold such a position in the CGIAR system. In these capacities, he was able to help developing countries establish their agricultural research infrastructure. His stint in Europe gave him a window to how modern educational institutions develop. This came in handy when he decided to return to the Philippines in 1993 as president of the University of the Philippines system. If I were a historian, I would mark 1993 as the beginning of his second half century of exceptionally creative public service. As president of the UP system, he continued to build great institutions, among them the UP Open University, UP Mindanao, the National Institutes of Health in UP Manila, the Learning Resource Center, and the Pahinungud Program, which is UP's program to deploy volunteer faculty and students to underserved communities. On hindsight, the Open University prepared UP for the challenges of online learning during the pandemic, aside from making UP education accessible to more deserving scholars. UP Mindanao was established along the same theme of equity and access. His heart for the underprivileged but capable knows no, li no limits. As UP president, he established the Excellence Equity Admission System 
wherein bright young boys and girls from academically deficient regions such as Muslim Mindanao were given a chance to get a UP education. He backed this up with the establishment of the Learning Resource Center and the Summer Bridge Program wherein incoming students in UP Mindanao were prepared for the rigors of UP education before their first semester at UP. Retirement from UP in 1999 did not mean retirement from public service for national scientist Xavier. After all, he was just 59 years old, young enough to start a new career. First as chair of the Technical Advisory Council of the CGIAR, this new career is symbolic of his return to his roots which is agriculture. As the TAC chair, National Scientist Javier served as an articulate spokesperson for the needs of third world agriculture in the highest echelon of world agricultural science. He had the strategic role and privilege of helping steer the large global enterprise of the CGIAR toward the commodities, traits, and problems which were important to the poor in developing countries. His committee helped ensure that the quality of science at the CGIR institutes was not only advanced and at the cutting edge, but also directly relevant to the needs and conditions of the poor and of developing countries. As a member and later president of the National Academy of Science and Technology of the Philippines, he devoted a lot of energy and patience leading a multi-sectoral team in preparing Philippine Agriculture 2020, a voluminous master plan for implementing the Agriculture and Fishery Modernization Act. Released in 2010, bits and pieces of this plan continue to guide programs of many government agencies, notably DA, DOST, and local governments to this day. His latest brainchild is the Coalition for Agriculture Modernization of the Philippines, or CAMP, which is an advo advocacy group drawing from the public and private sectors. CAMP has actively lobbied for the recently passed Coconut Levy Act, and the recent initiative of the Department of Agriculture to establish a system of provincial agricultural extension service. National scientist Xavier regularly publishes a column in Manila Bulletin documenting his ideas and advocacies about modernization of agriculture. Now in his 80s, national scientist Xavier is as active as he was at a younger age, continuing to provide leadership, inspiration, and direction to the broad communities of scientists, educators, public servants, and agriculturists. Indeed, he has touched and continues to touch many lives in the most impactful ways. It is a measure of his humanity, his sense of gratitude, that national scientist Javier continues to report for work at IPB to this day as a pro bono consultant, inspiring young researchers, offering wise advice to those willing to listen. He holds office in the very first room that visitors at IPB will find upon entering the main building. Thus, I imagine strangers mistake him for an overqualified receptionist. He remembers to give back to the institute that started his career as institution builder and academic leader 
achievements for which we are now honoring him with a prestigious recognition as Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. May I now yield the floor to his formal uh, awarding. May I call upon Regent Myla R. Pedrano, Regent Rene Luis Co, Regent Emeline Barion Dupo, Regent Maria Arlisa Diaz Aguiluz, Regent Angelo A. Jimenez, and Regent Francis C. Laurel to witness the conferment. May I also call upon Mrs. Alma L. Javier to assist in the conferment. May I also call on President Danilo L. Concepcion on stage. To read the citation in English, the Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Dr. Jose V. Camacho, Jr. To read the citation in Filipino, the Secretary of the University and of the Board of Regents, Attorney Roberto M. J. Lara. Honorary degrees today confer upon Emil Q. Javier the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Para sa kanyang natatangi pagtatatag ng maraming prestigioso at tanyag na mga institusyon sa universidad. Para sa kanyang pagtatatag ng institusyon at pamumuno sa paglikha ng mga pambansang surian ng pananaliksik sa pagkain at pagsasaka upang mapunan ang tradisyonal na sistemang pang-akademikong kagawaran. Para sa kanyang matalas at malawak na pananaliksik, sulatin at serbisyo publiko sa larangan ng pagpapalahi ng halaman at tropikal na agronomiyang pampastulan at ang paggamit nito sa pinagsama-samang mga sistema ng tanim hayo na pagsasaka. Para sa pagsusulong ng makabagong teknolohiya at sistematikong mga kaparaanan na humantong sa mahuhusay ng mga patakaran at polisiyang pang-agrikultura, mga pagbabago sa agrikultura at pinabuting mga sistema ng pamamahala. 
para sa kanyang hindi matatawaran at habang buhay na paglilingkod at adhikai mapabuti ang kabahuayan ng mga Pilipinong magsasaka at mangingisda. Ipinagkakaloob ngayon ng lupon ng mga rehente ng Universidad ng Pilipinas, alinsunod sa rekomendasyon ng Pangulo ng Universidad ng Pilipinas at ng Komite ng Titulong Pandangal, kay Emil Q. Javier, ang titulong doktorado ng batas, honoris causa. Bilang katibayan sa pagkilala at karangalan, iginagawad ng Universidad ng Pilipinas ang diploma. At kasuotang pandangal, ngayong ika-anim ng Marso, taong 2021. Danilo L. Concepcion, Pangulo ng Universidad ng Pilipinas. Pinatutunayan Roberto M. J. Lara, kalihim ng Universidad at ng Lupon ng mga rehente. Ladies and gentlemen, may we present to you Emil Q. Javier, Doctor of Laws. Honorable members of the Board of Regents of the University of the Philippines, fellow members of the National Academy of Science and Technology, fellow students, staff, faculty, and alumni of the university, Fellow workers in government, friends, colleagues, mga kababayang Pilipino, a pleasant afternoon for all of us. Thank you, Dr. Rasko, for that uh, kind and rather lengthy introduction. In case you have not noticed, Dr. Rasco and I are fellow plant breeders and are fellow members of a mutual admiration society. And that should explain the effusive introduction. Thank you, Dong.
At the outset, allow me to express my sincere appreciation to all those sharing with me this important milestone in my life journey. And especially so to those of you in Baker Hall for daring to come in spite of the risk from COVID-19 that goes with being part of a crowd in a closed space. Let me thank as well the Board of Regents led by no less than its illustrious Vice Chair and beloved President of the University, the Honorable Danilo Concepcion, the other regents, uh, if I may call and refer to them, Regent Angelo Jimenez, Regent Maria Arlisa Aguiluz, Regent Aimee Barion Dupo, Regent Rene Luis Co, Regent Myla Pedrano, and last but not the least, our own Regent from UP Los Baños, the Honorable Francis Laurel. Matabang mataba ang puso ko ngayong hapon kasi after so many years as president of UP, I know that there are not so many regions who attend the conferment of honorary degrees. But today, I am very happy and very thankful that the Board of Regents is in full force. Thank you very much. A special thanks to the outgoing Chancellor, Dindo Sanchez, who I understand endorsed my nomination for the honorary degree. Thank you, Dindo. The honorary degree I received today is a recognition of, a, of lifelong service and commitment to the university and to the nation. It goes without saying <clears throat> that it was made possible only with the gener generous help, encouragement, of so many kind and well-meaning people along my life journey. Whatever I have become or have accomplished would not have been possible without the generous help and support of so many kind people. These benefactors friends, colleagues, partners, and co-workers provided me guidance, moral support, and encouragement, and worked with me in the various initiatives I have been associated. Sadly, many of those benefactors and friends have gone on and are no longer with us. But many more are still very much alive. And today, I would take the privilege of uh, recognizing some of those people who are very close to me 
and you are very much a part of what I am. First, from my land breeding family, I want to recognize my longtime mentor and sometimes tormentor, national scientist Dolores Ramirez. Also, my best friends forever, uh, Ruben Villarreal and Susie Carpena. I have so many fond memories of my stint as UP president. And fortunately, this afternoon, there are at least three of them who are here and who somehow found the time to join me in this uh, momentous occasion. First, I'd like to recognize the UP Manila Chancellor, Menchi Padilla, who was the lead implementer of the UP Pahinungod program, which among all those things that I was associated with, is the one dearest and closest to me, the Pahinungod program. And uh, Dr. Menchit Padilla was a leading uh, person in the implementation of the Pahinungod program. She is as well uh, giving meaning and, and push for the National Institutes of Health which is now increasingly becoming influential. Uh, the NIH was established uh, during my term as president. Also with us today is the current vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Sincha Banson Bautista. <laughs> One of the activities that really attracted attention during my term of president was the strategic studies conducted by the whole system under the UCEDS, or the University Center for Integrative Development Studies, which was led by uh, Cynthia. And the third, but not the least, is no less than the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology, Honorable Fortunato de la Peña. In the early 80s, when Boy, whom I call, I, we call, we fondly called him Boy, I recruited him from UP to become the very young planning officer of the National Science and Technology Authority, which is now the DOST. Later on, when I became president, I requested Boy to help me to become my president for planning and development. So the history between me and Secretary Boy goes a long, long way. I have repeatedly acknowledged my indebtedness to many people, including the ones I just uh, mentioned. But it always had been in private. So I took the rare opportunity to thank them publicly. But there is another person whom I have never acknowledged in public but who had been the real wind beneath my wings more than anybody else during all these years. And this is no other than my uh, beautiful better half, Alma.
most of my professional life was spent with the university and in the government service, <clears throat> except for a few years abroad on international assignment. These responsibilities demanded so much time and effort, pre precious attention and energy, which otherwise would have been spent with the family to raise a brood of five children. But Alma was and had always been there, keeping the family together. And with no distraction to slow me down, she allowed me the luxury of devoting all my energies, time, and attention to my public obligations. So today, Bobby, thank you from the bottom of my heart. <clears throat> On a similar occasion like this, a year ago at Malacanang, when President Duterte conferred on me the honor and title of National Scientist, I expressed the misgiving that I was receiving the award with mixed emotion. Who would not be happy with the rare recognition? But I confessed I was receiving the award with a heavy heart and a sense of emptiness because sadly, the field of endeavor to which I have devoted my career exclusively has not brought prosperity to our poor farmers and fisher folks. The agriculture we know is not a monolith, but actually consists of two hubs. The first one being the modern progressive sector involving the agribusiness corporations, the larger, more affluent farmers, and those farmers who have access to rural infrastructure, access to credit and inputs, and access to markets. But the other half, which constitute by far the greater majority, are the farmers with small fragmented farms often with no access to rural in infrastructure, and most importantly, with little access to credit with which to acquire the necessary inputs. And even worse, these poor farmers are consistently shorted in the marketplace with their low volume and inferior produce who suffer huge losses in forced harvest and incur high cost in transport on logistics. Given the sorry state of Philippine agriculture, I am certain that I speak for all the professionals of agriculture, and the many graduates of UP Los Baños that we collectively admit that we have done our best, but our efforts had not been enough. So this afternoon, I chose a theme lifting the bottom half. What more and what else do we need to do to help our poor 
marginalized <coughs> farmers and fisher folk. What do we have to do differently to lift the bottom half? This embarrassing status of Philippine agriculture is reflected in three gross national statistics. First, on poverty incidence. Second, on food and agriculture trade. And third, on farm level yields. Allow me briefly to elaborate on these three statistics because they are precisely the metrics we have to address and improve upon if we were to turn around the fortunes of the agriculture sector and in particular the income and well-being of farmers. In terms of poverty, among the larger five larger economies in the ASEAN, namely Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam, excluding Singapore, which has little agriculture. We in the Philippines with the highest poverty incidence at 26%. Compare this with the poverty incidence in Vietnam at 13%, Indonesia 11 Thailand 10 and Malaysia less than 1%. We have the dishonor of having the highest incidence of poverty in the region at 26%. And worse, a bigger part of that poverty is accounted for by the rural sector at a ratio of 36% against 13%. Or the farmers are three times more likely to be poor than the city dwellers. In terms of uh, food and agriculture statistics, trade statistics, among the ASEAN five, our exports in 2018 were a measly $5 billion. But during the same year, Thailand exported $42 billion, Indonesia, $36 billion, Malaysia, $27, and Vietnam, $23 compared with our $5 billion worth of exports. And worse, we have the stigma of the only ASEAN community with a negative trade balance in food and agriculture. We have a trade deficit of $6 billion in food and agriculture in 2018. We are short of $6 billion worth of food, and, uh, food products. On the other hand, Thailand has a healthy surplus of $27 billion, Indonesia, $19 billion, Malaysia, $9 billion, and Vietnam, $9 billion. So we have the ignominy of the only negative, negative uh, food producer in the ASEAN. This dismal state of our agriculture is reflected as well at the farm level. In a study comparing the yields of 20 crops common to the ASEAN region, we were consistently the last among these five economies, except only in bananas and pineapple. A lot has been written about 
what had been wrong with our agriculture. Among them, lack of knowledge and technology among our aging farmers, inadequate rural infrastructure, low level of modern inputs, disorganized markets, poor logistics, excessive and lopsided resource allocation to rice, and grossly inadequate investments in processing and exports, and finally, to extensive losses due to natural calamities like typhoons, floods, and droughts. So among these factors to explain our dismal performance in agriculture, obviously we cannot do much with the natural calamities except to anticipate them as best as we can, mitigate their impacts, provide insurance, and organize for a quick turnaround. But for the rest of the factors, they are man-made, and we have the opportunity to amend or correct them. For so long, we have been proud that UP Los Baños in particular is the leading higher education institution in agriculture, forestry, and veterinary medicine. But unfortunately, that claim of supremacy has to be, is inevitably linked with the performance of our agriculture. The underperformance of Philippine agriculture relative to our ASEAN neighbors with roughly similar natural endowments cannot be helped but linked with our performance as, a, as an institution. The kinds of graduates we produce, the technologies we generate, and the rural development programs we initiate and propose to government and to the extent we are involved in their execution. And so this is the message of the rest, it is the gist of my message for the rest of the afternoon. In plain language, UP Los Baños, we as individuals and collectively are part and source of the inadequacies of our agriculture. We must candidly and with full humility accept that we were part of the problem. And the solution or solutions could very well start with us now. The rest of my message this afternoon has to do with what I believe are the urgent reforms UPLB as an institution has to undertake to make our agricultural industry not just more productive and more competitive, but more specifically to improve the well-being of the majority of the small producers meaning to leave the bottom half. In fairness to UPLB, what had been amiss with Philippine agriculture was not because we devoted our energies and resources into what were wrong, but rather of the things we did not do enough. In other words, it was not as much as wrongdoing, but the sin of omission. 
omission of what we have not done enough and what could we have done better. For these purposes, I will dwell on six reforms or redirections which the university has to undertake to push our agriculture forward. The first among these six internal reforms of Los Baños has to do with the social sciences in campus and the need to reinforce these disciplines in UPLB. In the first place, it's time to recognize and remind ourselves that the greater challenges of our agriculture are not so much on the agri part, but on the culture part. In fact, the bigger and more problematic part of our challenges in agriculture has to do with governance and social conflict. Thus, my first recommendation is UPLB, for UPLB to endeavor to reinforce the social science offerings in the campus with the same rigor as we do for the natural sciences. Unfortunately, the lament of the late national scientist Helia Castillo continues to haunt Los Baños today. Forty-two years ago, when I became the second chancellor of UPLB, Helia Castillo penned a position paper with the title, Los Baños Social Scientists Thus Second-Class Citizens in a World-Class University. It was a not so subtle reminder from Dr. Castillo that my first obligation as chancellor has to do with strengthening the social sciences. Unfortunately, the observation remains true today. There are so many stakeholders in agriculture, not only us in government, academe, and the regulatory agencies, but also the local governments, the private sector, the agribusiness community, and the farmers and rural folks themselves. The reforms called for have to do not only on what we need to do, meaning the substance or content of what we research and teach, but as importantly, our approach and how we do things. Therefore, authentic periodic consultations with various stakeholders should be part and parcel of our agenda in UP Los Baños and the manner that we do things. Therefore, the initiative of our young chancellor, Jose Camacho, Jr., and the UPLB alumni to regularly convene a university alumni private sector dialogue is in order. I note that the pillars of the UPLBAA are here in Baker Hall in the persons of uh, President Leo Balispin, Regent Laurel, Captain Manny Baradas, Billy Gualberto, Nick Chavez, and Resti Collado. This is precisely what we need to do today. And uh, we are, I personally am 100% behind the initiative of, this, of the UPLBAA to bring together 
academe and the business sector and the farmers regularly on campus to talk things over. The second reform I have in mind has to do with the elaboration of schemes to consolidate our farms into larger, more efficient management units. After all of these years of studying, teaching, and engaging in farming myself, I have come around the conclusion that the greater part of our inadequacies, inadequacies in agriculture are linked or rooted in the fragmentation and smallness of our farms, which lack economies of scale in many aspects. This smallness and fragmentation, in our fragmentation unfortunately, was made worse by agrarian reform, which was a political necessity 50 years ago when the republic was in a perilous state and was close to be run, overrun by the rebellious forces of the left. These constraints from smallness pervade at all stages of the food supply chain, all the way from cultural operations, mechanization, the non-credit worthiness of small farmers, and therefore the lack of means to acquire inputs, the lack of leverage in the market due to the small volumes, and the timeliness to match market demand, and high transaction cost and poor logistics. So the most obvious solution to this constraint of small fragmented farms is the lifting of the five hectare limit on land holdings imposed by agrarian reform. This will allow the more progressive farmers and agribusiness entities to consolidate farms into more manageable operating units suitable for mechanization and other operations, more amenable to aggregate sourcing of inputs, as well as the proper programming of volume and timing of produce. After 50 years of agrarian reform and distributing 8 million hectares of land, we can very well declare victory, abandon agrarian reform, and move on. However, however this will be politically contentious and divisive, and Congress is not likely anytime soon to make this big leap of faith of reversing agrarian reform. Hence, for the time being, short of reversing agrarian reform, the solution is not one, but several complementary steps. Relief will have to come with the consolidation of specific aspects of farm operation and integration of various stages in the supply chain, but skirting the emotional issue of land ownership and titles. Indeed, there are a number of alternative complementary ways to accomplish farming consolidation, such as organizing farmers into large management units like cooperatives, producers associations, land reform beneficiaries, 
and Irrigators Association. We can achieve consolidation also by concentrating production in strategic areas. In areas those commodities are most ecologically suitable and with good access to market. We can achieve the same with leasing arrangements and very, very importantly and significantly, contract growing schemes linking small producers to millers, processors, exporters, and supermarkets, or the integrators. The consolidation of our farms into more efficient, larger management units call for different business models and social constructs. We can learn and benchmark from our ASEAN neighbors and adapt these business models to our economic, social, political, and market conditions. And this is an area that I think we should really take on very seriously, that universities should take the lead in the elaboration of such schemes that would facilitate consolidation of our small fragmented land holdings. The third reform I have in mind had to do with the reorientation of our uh, programs in the university from being mainly production-led to demand and market-driven supply chain planning and programming. Unfortunately, for all these years, UPLB has been preoccupied with looking into the component technologies that go with higher productivity. The generation of production technology had been our strength. And for the most part, we had been very good at it. We had been assuming all along that those dimensions that have to do with markets, commercialization, and profits are below our dignity as scholars and are better addressed by the private sector. Unfortunately, it has not worked that way. Henceforth, we have to pay more attention to the, the, to the market and the demands, not only in quantity, but also in quality and timeliness of delivery. We have romanticized for so long the simplicity and naturalness of small farms looking after the well-being of individual farmers and their households to meet their immediate food needs. I'm referring to the Bahai Kubo ideal. Yes, they are important, but that orientation on on-farm self-sufficiency can only take us so far to elevate their standard of living, our farmers must produce for the market beyond their household requirements. And to do that more efficiently and more effectively and more equitably, our farmers should be brought in as former players in the food supply chains. So to be competitive domestically and in the world markets, and the increase and increase income of our farmers, we in the university have to participate more actively in the development of uh, industry roadmaps and in diversification and enhancement of exports. The fourth reform that we need to go into 
has to do with value adding and in the food and beverage manufacturing industry. Primary agriculture accounts for a little less than 10% of our gross domestic product. Food and beverage manufacturing, on the other hand, which depends on primary agriculture, account for 27% of our GDP. Unfortunately, most of our efforts in LB have been directed to primary production, which understandably is the immediate source of livelihood of the majority of our rural folk. Consequently, have been missing out on the more profitable value-adding aspects of agriculture. We should therefore pay more attention and invest more efforts to post-harvest processing in food chemistry, microbiology, biotechnology, and food engineering. We have, in fact, dedicated academic units for these uh, activities but they must not be silos, and they must work closely together with the private sector. Therefore, food and beverage manufacturing should be the immediate priority and the strategic direction of our emerging status as a leading engineering university. Uh, I guess many people have not noticed it, but Los Baños is no longer just agriculture and, and forestry. But we are increasingly uh, making a name for ourselves and in engineering. And therefore, our new units in engineering should take food and beverage manufacturing as their strategic priority. Many of our alumni are in fact leading personalities as operations and technical managers in the food and beverage manufacturing industry. My appeal therefore is for all our alumni in the food and beverage manufacturing sector to visit the campus more often, oft, often, to direct our faculty and students into the most profitable, researchable areas in the industry. The, the fifth reform has to do with managing the trade-offs between farming intensification and care of the environment. This is a very serious issue because uh, the intensification of farming to produce more food with less water is going to be a, a very, very important point into the future. So among all institutions of higher learning in the country, uh, Los Baños has the most resources and faculty on looking after the environment. And that environment has three major components. Uh, conservation of fresh water, conservation of soils, and conservation of biodiversity. In water, the world is running out of fresh water. But fortunately, in the Philippines, we have an average of 2,400 millimeters of rain every year. That volume of precipitation is more than enough to meet our annual water needs. 
and it's therefore a matter of capturing the rainfall in small ponds, reservoirs, and dams, big and small, and by protecting the watersheds. Since agriculture accounts for as much as 80% of freshwater use, UPLB should continue to pursue its efforts in water use efficiency through more drought tolerant, drought -tolerant crops and better designed and better managed irrigation systems. But foremost among the challenges in water is resolving the conflicts in water use and their, reg and their regulation and co governance with the 30 odd agencies with statutory mandate on water. So my recommendation is UPLB should proceed and consolidate all our initiatives in water to establish the country's first National Water Resources Management Research Center. UPLB is uniquely positioned to offer this with our academic expertise in irrigation and drainage, in crop management, in water management and governance. So specifically, the idea of a national center for water resources had been in the agenda of Los Baños for a number of years already. So I urge the chancellor and the faculty to finally move ahead and seek approval of the Board of Regents and for Congress legislation for such National Center for Water Resources Management. In soil erosion and soil conservation, the truth is uh, soil loss is our most insidious environmental problem in the years to come. It takes a thousand years, a millennium, millennium, to develop an inch of soil. And yet, every year, we see tons and tons of soil uh, drifting in our rivers towards uh, the sea. Unfortunately, this soil losses is overlooked and uh, not recognized as such. And we can do much about soil losses because there are two ways of moderating soil erosion. The first has to do with agronomy, the practice of minimum tillage, direct seeding, and cover cropping. So this is a call for our colleagues in agronomy and horticulture to pay more attention to what is called conservation agriculture. We have to pay more attention on soil losses as we push for higher yields and productivity. And the second way of moderating soil erosion is proper watershed management. Managing our slope lands better with more complete canopy cover with forest trees, with industrial crops like coconut, coffee, cacao, rubber, and other high value crops, both for domestic consumption and export. And the most significant culprit in our annual humongous losses of soils is the growing of 
raw crops like rice and corn on hillsides. So together with the local government units, the DA and DNR, UPLB should lead in a national effort to gradually replace or ban the growing of row crops on the hillsides and replace them with plantation tree crops, coconut, coffee, uh, rubber, and so on. Agroforestry. We should remind our colleagues in DNR that agroforestry is economically more meaningful and sustainable than simply regreening. Our trust is regreening, but I think that is misdirected. It ought to be agroforestry because with agroforestry, you take care as well of the food needs, immediate food needs of, of the people. So again, we among the higher institutions of higher learning is in the best position with our acclaimed expertise in agronomy, agroforestry, and forest management to raise the national awareness of soil erosion as our most insidious, irreversible environment problem in the long term. The are, are aspect of the environment is the conservation of biodiversity. We have the fortune of having one of the densest uh, population of plants and animals. But we also have the, the bad reputation as being a global hotspot in biodiversity loss. The conservation of biodiversity takes two approaches, in situ conservation and ex situ, ex -situ conservation. In situ meaning the conservation of plants and animals in the wild by way of forests, parks, marine parks, and the like. And for this, we can congratulate our College of Forestry because Mount Makiling is the best preserved forest park in the country today. So we should continue doing that and make it as a model of in situ conservation for the rest of the ecological environments in the country. But the second, <clears throat> second dimension of biodiversity conservation is what is called ex situ conservation by way of seeds and planting materials and collections of domesticated uh, plants. And the mandate for that has been placed on the National Plant Genetic Resources Laboratory at IPB. And the immediate, the immediate challenge in biodiversity conservation uh, in situ is the loss of the, our heritage materials in the collections which are now in the hands of various agencies of government all over the country. In fact, <clears throat> uh, the administrator of the Philippine Coconut Authority is here, and may I take the opportunity to uh, recognize Administrator uh, Benjamin Madrigal and his assistant, Early Manohar. There's a, risk, a high risk of our collections uh, being lost forever, and uh, coconut is one of them. Coconut is one of our most important indigenous crops. And the Philippine Coconut Authority is paranoid over the prospects of loss of our national coconut collection in Zamboanga because of, to some extent, peace and order, but also from 
pests and diseases like the cocolism. And so the PCA is very keen on asking the university to set up a duplicate collection of our very precious coconut germplasm. The same is true for mango and all other crops. And so I am proposing that the university come forward with a proposal for a national duplicate collection of all our important uh, three species to be allocated an, an area of, say, 1,000 hectares in the Laguna land grant. I think this has to be done now because the, there's the danger of really losing forever these valuable genetic resources. The sixth and last internal reform has to do with the development and adoption of disruptive technologies, but biasing them to the needs of small farmers. We are now witnessing the emergence of disruptive technologies due to advances in biology, chemistry, new materials, and information and communication. Science and technology are in constant flux in all aspects of human endeavor, including food and agriculture. In the pipeline are genomics and gene editing, precision agriculture, protected cultivation, automation, deployment of sensors, of all kinds of sensors, sensors and drones. And now, especially with the pandemic, new digital transformation, data analytics, biosystematics, and artificial intelligence. Clearly, as the National University, it behooves that we master this technology ourselves to advance our national purposes. We have to be in the vanguard in these modernization efforts to stay competitive in the world marketplace. But there is a catch. By now, we should have learned that there are always winners and losers between those who have access to new technologies versus those who don't and who cannot. We should be aware that these disruptive technologies can, in fact, even widen the chasm between the hubs and the have-nots. These technologies could very well widen even more the gap between the modern agriculture sector and the marginalized sector we are mandated to serve. Fortunately, in the case of crop improvement with genomics and gene editing, the technologies are built into the seeds themselves. And therefore, it's a matter of having the farmers access to seeds with the improved genetic, with the genetic improvements. In other words, uh, in the case of genomics, the technologies can be scale neutral and should be equally accessible to small farmers and the modern farmers. So in these new, new disruptive technologies, I'll just uh, focus on one uh, development which will fit into the rubric of lifting the bottom half 
which I started to develop. One of these uh, information and technologies with profound implication to small farmers is the digital transformation of the agriculture supply chains. These emerging digital platforms are aggregating data from thousands of farms, which provide more precise data-driven insights on how to farm, how much fertilizer, and when to apply, the use of benign control methods, how our crops could cope with environmental stresses, and planning of production for the market. The big data access from sensors embedded in farm machines and aggregated soil and climatic information complemented with satellite imaging enable farmers, government agencies, lending institutions, manufacturers and suppliers, and buyers to make informed and timely decisions on how to best their manage their businesses and discharge their economic functions. Some of these digital platforms can and do connect the small farmers to the buyers and suppliers, bypassing for the most part the need for middlemen and intermediaries. You will recall that I am referring to one of these as one of the problems of why our small farmers remain poor because of uh, their lack of access to markets and that they have to rely on middlemen and intermediaries. The same digital platforms can enable banks to more easily determine the credit worthiness of farmer borrowers, how to, to mitigate the risk to the farmers and to the bank themselves, and in the end, provide insurance and facilitate timely payments. This is just one example of the kind of adaptations and applications that we in Los Baños to consider as high in our priorities as we master these disruptive technologies for our national purposes. And I'm reminded <clears throat> of a person in the crowd who is uh, precisely doing this uh, digital platform for the agricultural supply chain. I'm referring to Billy Gualberto, who is there who incidentally his uh, birthday today, but who still uh, decided to come. <clears throat> I'm sorry it has taken me so long, but uh, what the message I really is trying to bring across is, uh, in spite of the rosy things that we have heard today of what we are doing in Los Baños, we must be apologetic and contrite because the proof of the fooding is the, stature, the status of Philippine agriculture, especially our poor, marginalized farmers and fisher folks. So by that standard, we as an institution has really failed. And this institutional contrition must be part of the way of the, we look, look things uh, into the future. We must admit that we had been part of the problem of Philippine agriculture, and that underperformance reflects as well on our underperformance as an institution. We must exercise more efforts in helping the bottom half the lift, and lifting the bottom half. And we could do that by 
internal reforms and how we do things in Los Baños in the six areas that I just uh, uh, mentioned. So finally, finally, I cannot help but uh, call attention uh, to the university and to the, to the Board of Regents that with this pandemic, there is a clear challenge and opportunity for Los Baños to contribute its share in understanding, managing, and putting under control uh, these uh, diseases, zoonotic diseases, that are transferred from man to human beings. COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. It started with wildlife, they say from bats, but that those viruses have moved into humans. Uh, COVID-19 is not a singular black swan event. There will be more of this in the future. And so there's a need for us to understand better uh, these diseases that are transferred from, human, from livestock to human beings. And our College of Veterinary Medicine should take that initiative and establish our country's uh, first zoonosis disease center right here in Los Baños to complement our university efforts in the institutes of national, national institutes of health. So thank you and good day. Once again, our honorary Dr. Emil Q. Javier. Thank you very much, sir. We shall now usher our UP system officials to their seats, after which we shall play a video presentation of our honorees UPLB legacy lecture. Legacy lectures showcase our university's scholarly contributions, including those of the legacy lecturer to a particular field or discipline, underlining their roles in national development and in our university's journey toward becoming a future-proof university. Its live videotape or documentary is envisioned to subsequently serve as introductory lecture to the relevant general education or foundation course. In the past, the UPLB legacy lectures have been delivered by Dr. Nora C. Cabral, the mother of development communication, and national scientist Dolores A. Ramirez, the mother cell of Philippine genetics. Let us now watch the third UPLB legacy lecture by national scientist, Dr. Emil Q. Javier.
A visionary who pursued ideas well ahead of his time, Dr. Emil Q. Javier is a renowned scientist, educator, policymaker, and administrator who has unselfishly served the country for the better part of his life. He has laid the foundations for several institutions, not only in UP Los Baños, but also the whole UP system. Dr. Javier's contributions to the university date back to 1969, when, as a young faculty member, he spearheaded the establishment of the Crop Science Society of the Philippines, now the flagship crop science association in the country. Well, the idea came from my uh, faculty advisor from Cornell, Lloyd Crowder and the chair of my graduate committee, Dr. Ricardo Lantican. Of course, we were educated in the United States, so, so we are members and familiar with the Crap Science Society of America. And so the idea was very obvious. So why can't we have our own in the Philippines? So in 1975, Dr. Javier recommended the creation of the Institute of Plant Breeding under the College of Agriculture of UP Los Baños. This would be the first of several national research institutes he would later establish in his career. Comparing ourselves with Erie, we were not as productive as our counterparts across the railroad tracks. Uh, not because we were not as uh, academically prepared and competent as they were, we, we knew that they were better organized. And most importantly, they were working together uh, with the entomologists, the pathologists, the geneticists, and the other disciplines together. Uh, we were among ourselves plant breeders, but you know, we, our work has to relate with statistics, genetics, pathology, and entomology. And our department structure was not conducive to that kind of healthy interchange. So when the time came when we put up the Institute of Plant Breeding, the first thing we did was to organize a very strong biochem laboratory. And uh, we pirated uh, Professor Evelyn May Mendoza from the College of Medicine. Our biggest contribution are the breeders. All the big uh, seed companies now in the Philippines and even in Southeast Asia are alumni of IPB. So our biggest product now are not the varieties per se, but the people who are now in the seed industry. So now we have to shift from producing the varieties ourselves to producing the breeders at the same time the basic science. So balik niya doon sa biotechnology. That's why in IPB, we are leading in terms of applications of biotechnology in plant breeding. Even beyond UP Los Baños, Dr. Javier helped in boosting national capacity in biotechnology. So when we put up the Biotech Institute in Los Baños, we took care of the food and agriculture applications. And so, when I, I drafted the presidential decree, then President Odi Corpus said, Emil, how do you help the rest of the university? But that was not my problem. I was Chancellor of Los Baños, so I take care of Los Baños, but he was president. And so when I presented the idea to President Corpus, he said, how do you help the rest? So I said, well, uh, Mr. President, biotechnology has applications on all forms of life, including industry, environment, and medicine. But this institute we are putting up in Los Banos is confined to food and agriculture. So we will have other institutes. Appointed as the second chancellor of UP Los Banos in 1979, Dr. Javier formed a coherent and multidisciplinary program in food and agriculture, 
amid its widely dispersed research and development activities. We were uh, conscious of the fact that the first mandate for Eupilus Banyos was to lead the way in food, agriculture, and natural resources because that was our historical base and strength. And uh, we realized, of course, that we need resources, we have to be organized better, we have to integrate the disciplines, and we have, must have ideas of how do you generate resources. I read about the American universities, and one very obvious technique that they adapted was to have these organized research units in the university as a way of putting together ideas and attracting resources. We started, uh, we had a previous uh, institute called the Dairy Institute. That was the model uh, because that's a, a, a very specific mandate. And it was very easy to see that why we should uh, support the dairy industry because we are importing a lot of milk. So that was a precursor. During my time, we had this uh, institute model as a way of generating awareness, attention, and support, but also a way of integrating our, our work across disciplines. When I became chancellor, I did also for arts and sciences. We created three national centers for excellence in the basic sciences. Uh, because that was my uh, responsibility as chancellor. But by then, I was also science minister. So I had to take care also of the other units. So we created <coughs> the, the six centers of excellence in the basic sciences, three in Los Baños and three in Diliman. Only two years into his term as UP Los Baños chancellor, Dr. Javier was appointed minister of science. In this capacity, he introduced the scientific career system to strengthen the nation's pool of highly qualified and productive scientific personnel. We observed that uh, the reward system was uh, lopsided in favor of favoring administration to the point that the scientists who should really stay in the laboratories or in the field, inevitably aspire to be head of agencies as directors and so on. But unfortunately, most of our scientists are not cut out to be administrators. They're excellent scientists in the laboratory or in the fields. But they're not cut out for, for those kinds of responsibilities. So the idea was, why don't we have a Y-shaped career path? So those who are more in, in, inclined to managing people would go to the administrative path. But the real scientists would just stay on the right side. On the, so it's a Y-shape. But make sure that the, the highest ranks of scientists is comparable with those of administrators. So when I became minister, I said, well, uh, why don't I create a science career service sim similar to the career executive service, the CESO? So you know, that is it. And make sure that the salary grades go as high as salary grade 30, which is uh, secretary under secretary. Armed with his extensive experience in administration and leadership, and fueled by his desire to serve UP and the country, Dr. Javier was named 17th President of the University of the Philippines in 1994. His major proposition was, UP in the service of the nation. Well, as a graduate of UP, I suppose, uh, and having dedicated myself to academia, the highest position one can aspire is to be president of UP. And the opportunity came, and so I was asked if I was interested, and I said yes. And, uh, and then we went through the process. 
We had for at that time about 4,000 faculty members. We had the best minds in the country. So the role of the UP president is just to lead the direction and generate the resources. So I, I thought that my, my role was quite simple. Let them do what they're supposed to do because they're the smartest and the brightest in the land. And there are 4,000 of them. And so I saw my role as setting the directions and then fighting for resources to make them able uh, to enable the faculty to do what they're supposed to do. The Javier UP presidency focused on advancing academic and scientific excellence, democratizing access to quality education, modernizing university services and facilities, and above all, addressing pressing issues of the country. Among his most notable contributions to the university is the establishment of the UP Open University, UP Ugnayan ng Pahinungod, and UP Provident Fund. With the goal of harnessing the full potential of science and technology for the benefit of the Filipinos, Dr. Javier established Alianza ng mga grupong haligi ng agham at teknolohiya para sa mamamayan or agham in 2007. Yeah, under the 87 Constitution, there was a provision for party list, and the idea was to <clears throat> provide a an opportunity for those who are less politically connected, the marginalized people, to have representation in Congress. So there was a group of scientists and technologists who thought that was a good idea. Unfortunately, we didn't make it in our first try. We were short of, I think, 12,000 votes. But I was uh, very disappointed because uh, they made the mockery of the, the concept. It was hijacked by the politicians. So anyway, we encouraged Angelo Palmones, who was one of our initial group from, from media. And we succeeded second time with Angelo. But the third time, uh, with the politicians really moving in, we had no, no chance. So that was the end of the Agam Party list. Despite these challenges, and even after his term as UP president, Dr. Javier continued to serve the university, particularly UP Los Baños. I always convinced that education would be a major factor in the future of our country. And AUP will always have a, a place, especially the kind of uh, alumni will be uh, producing. Ikasama na doon yung values kasi magaling ka ha, eh, wala ka namang puso. Eh, nyo. <clears throat> so, that was my uh, that's, that's my continuing uh, motivation. Uh, and of course, for Los Banos, we'll always need food. We can't get away with that. So we need to, to develop that sector with uh, people. Dr. Javier's exceptional achievements have well demonstrated how science and technology and knowledge institutions could be utilized for public welfare. For his outstanding contributions to the progress of science and technology in the Philippines and the world, Dr. Javier was conferred the Order of National Scientist in January 2019. Altogether, Dr. Javier's story of institution building and leadership serves to instill in all of us the commitment and moral obligation to serve the nation. EQJ, a legacy of institutions in UPLB and beyond.
May we invite back on stage our UP Board of Regents and the honorary Dr. Javier for the singing of UP Naming Mahal and the Exit of Colors.
This formally closes the conferment ceremony. Maraming salamat po.